Hi, this is Tony Sobosinski, and, and we're continuing our Advent ser series. This is the last uh, Wednesday of Advent. Uh, next Thursday is Christmas Eve. And so this is part two of a supernatural activity that happened at the Advent or the coming of Jesus uh, at Christmas. Uh, and it focuses on God speaking through people, through prophecy. <clears throat> Just to repeat the silent nights uh, of, of the time between uh, the book of Malachi and the Old Testament up until uh, the time of John the Baptist and Jesus being born. God said in Amos chapter 8, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. This is a time of silence that God promised in punishment. And yet at Christmas, the first Advent, right before that is happening, there's just all kinds of supernatural activity uh, that seems to come out of nowhere. We have supernatural activity of angels. We have a supernatural activity of a prophet coming forth again, being born, John the Baptist. Uh, we have a, a supernatural activity of signs from the heavens. Uh, the Christmas star leading uh, wise men from far away to come and find the birth of, of, of Jesus. And we have what is called the gift of prophecy. Now, this gift of prophecy is found in the Old Testament, and more so uh, after Jesus comes into the world and the gift of the Holy Spirit is, is poured out upon all people. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter explained, for some reason, that these men are not drunk, as you suppose, and we wonder why they would suppose that they were drunk. Since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So he quotes Joel and says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. In other words, not just specific times on certain groups of people and certain prophets, but on all believers. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants in those days. I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So in First Samuel chapter 10, and we also see this happening again in chapter 18 of First Samuel, we have the, the prophecy of the first king of Israel. So Samuel was a great prophet, a man of God. And he came uh, after a time of, uh, of spiritual deterioration before him. Anyway, he came and took a flask of oil and poured it on his head. And this is Saul. And he kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And the word anointed is the same word that we get the word Messiah from, Mashiach. And you shall reign over the people of, of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And Saul as king would be anointed, and, and he would be uh, uh, someone who would reign over the people. He'd be the king, and he would also provide salvation in a physical sense from the surrounding enemies they had then. And Samuel goes on to say, And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over this heritage. You shall come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. Now the Philistines were the enemies of God's people. They're the ones who occupied the land of Canaan with all their uh, pagan gods. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them prophesying. 
and we do find this uh, uh, in the Old Testament. There, there are instances where spiritual music, if you will, spiritual people, in a sense of prayer, uh, in the presence of God, playing different kinds of instruments musically, while at the same time people are prophesying or speaking forth the words that God is putting into their hearts and into their uh, mouths and loosing their tongues to do. So Samuel goes on speaking to Saul, Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. And that's conversion. That's what happens to us when the Holy Spirit uh, comes into our lives. Uh, he turns us into new uh, people. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And prophecy and God being with us are linked together, and the Spirit of God being with us. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, that is Saul, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day when they came to Gibeah. Behold, a group of prophets met him. And we keep finding these groups of prophets, sometimes called the company of prophets, the school of prophets sometimes. And the Spirit of God rushed upon him and he prophesied among them. So Saul prophesied by the Spirit of God. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish, that's Saul? Is Saul also among the prophets? In other words, they saw him in his past life and couldn't believe that somehow he had changed and now was prophesying with the prophets of God. It seems strange that he was in their company. But that only lasted a while. Uh, he became king, but he just couldn't. He just couldn't obey God. He was always doing something wrong, disobediently. So God decides that no more. He's got to be replaced as king. God basically is going to say, "You're fired." And he puts a new person, who will be chosen to be the next king. So in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So he knew it was one of his sons, but he didn't know which one. So Samuel goes over to Jesse's home, visits his family, and talks to all of his sons. But Samuel gets no indication that any of these sons are the one that God is choosing. So Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So this is God speaking to Samuel. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So now David, after he is anointed, that's why sometimes we'll say being anointed with the Holy Spirit. Because once the Spirit comes upon us, uh, from that day forward, we have new abilities, God-given abilities, and relationship with God. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Maybe this is where David writes at one of the Psalms. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
because God took his Holy Spirit from Saul because of his constant disobedience. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So what happened is Saul turned from a man that his heart had been changed and among the prophets and God's appointed king to Saul the assassin. He wanted to kill and murder David because it threatened his kingship and he threatened his son's uh, kingship after him. And so he decided he had to get rid of David. Much of uh, the, the, the story of David is him f running away from Saul. So it says, David, in 1 Samuel 19, David fled and escaped, and he came to uh, Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Naioth. Saul sent messengers to take David, in other words, to capture him with bad intent. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing his head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. There seems to be a residual effect when you get in the company and the presence of spiritual people. And that doesn't mean you're necessarily changed, but you, you receive some of those effects of the people who are spiritual. So these army soldiers from Sam from Saul coming to capture David to take him back to the, so that uh, Saul can eliminate him they're filled with the Spirit of God and they prophesy so when it was told Saul he sent other messages and they also prophesied and Saul sent messengers again the third time and they also prophesied then he himself went so he kind of got tired of this. He sends out his soldiers to go and capture David. And they keep on going out having these religious experiences and coming back with nothing. So Saul says, well, I'll have to do this myself. And when he, that is Saul, went there to Naioth in Ramah, and the Spirit of the God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naioth in Ramah, and he too, so someone else had done the same thing, he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. So maybe, at least it makes me think of this verse, sometimes when God gets a hold of our lives, uh, our dignity can be compromised. And if we really respond, uh, we find out that we praise him and we can look a little crazier drunk to other people. Because really it is intoxicating, if you will allow me to use that word, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter is saying on the day of Pentecost, when God poured out his Holy Spirit and other people who didn't have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them were looking on to this event and they're saying, they're just, they're drunk. But Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So this had been prophesied. It had been predicted. God had spoken through the the prophet Joel. Peter quotes Joel, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. In other words, not just certain people in the school of the prophets or certain prophets in the Old Testament or certain people, even certain kings, but on all believers and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This is something that will be common to all believers, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And these, this is the supernatural activity. It goes on to say, and there will be uh, signs in the sun and the moon and so on. 
supernatural activities and, and uh, just exploded in frequency uh, at, on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. So Paul speaks about this gift of prophecy a little bit and what it means. And we take all these different passages and we can start putting together the puzzle. He says, pursue love. And remember, 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter before this is the love chapter. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. We are to crave and earnestly desire to have spiritual gifts so that we can serve God supernaturally with his power. And he says, especially that you may prophesy. So one of the, the, the greatest gift to, to desire and earnestly desire is the gift of prophecy. Verse 3 says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. So this is God supernaturally filling us and as we prayerfully turn our lives over to him he gives us words and even if we are reading the bible it has more power to it because god is with us and we are prophesying the words that have already been prophesied if you will and they come out with power and i've heard people say and i've i've had the same experience sometimes uh You'll be in a situation where someone is asking a question and maybe they're inquiring about what it means to be a Christian. And you give an answer that seems way beyond your own IQ and, and people will say, and I've said it, that couldn't have been from me because I'm not that good. I could have never thought up those words to say that that way. But because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, he gives us that prophecy, that anointed again, spiritually supersized, if you will, uh, communication that comes from us. So the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. And this literally comes from a word to mean build a building. And it's applied to uh, uh, believers so that we, we're building another believer up so that he grows in wisdom, piety, holiness, happiness, all these wonderful things, because God is either anointing with his Holy Spirit and giving supernatural communication as we read and explain the scripture, which is the pure prophecy of God. You can bet on that. When If it's written in the Bible, it's been approved, verified, certified. Or if it's just a common conversation and God is giving us answers and speaking through us and blessing other people. And he adds these two other words. Uh, uh, well, let's just go back for a second look at it. So uh, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and for their encouragement and consolation. Now these words are pretty close. They're almost what we call synonyms. And that means words that basically mean the same thing, slightly different, but almost the same. And the first one means uh, a call to, to come closer, to walk with me. It's almost like saying, come over here and walk with me for a while. And that's what God is saying. And that's how he gives us encouragement. It's a positive thing. It brings comfort and refreshment and encouragement to have him and his presence walking with us. And the next word, very close to that, but it means speaking closely. Uh, it means, like he says, come over here, I want to talk to you. And he whispers in our ear, encouraging, comforting, things that build us up. And he gives us that power to bring that blessing to other people. That's what the Apostle Paul talks about when he describes prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14. And even though we know from the rest of the Bible that it does include predicting the future, he doesn't even mention that in 1 Corinthians 14. So again, Advent, at the coming of Jesus, that's what the word Advent means. There's supernatural activity 
that is just kind of exploding, if you will. Uh, and then with all these different things happening, first to really happen after the pregnancy of uh, Mary and Elizabeth, Les Elizabeth became pregnant uh, with John the Baptist before Mary. So he's born slightly six months or so, something like that before Jesus is born. Anyway, John the Baptist is born and he's a prophet, first prophet in 400 years. He's born and his parents take him when he is eight days old to be circumcised and to give him his name. And they would always name the child uh, on that day of circumcision at eight days old. In Luke chapter one, it says they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. Now remember, Zechariah was made so by the angel Gabriel so that he couldn't speak when he, since he came out of the, the, the temple area because he doubted what Gabriel was saying. So he can't speak. So they're asking his mother. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. That was the customary way. You know, this is the father. Let's name him Zechariah. But none of the relatives, you're not naming off the father, anyone. And they made signs to his father, trying to do sign language, inquiring what he wanted to, him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And it says, and they all wondered. It says they, they, they wondered what kind of child was this going to be with all the supernatural activity uh, happening around his birth. And after he writes that letter, it says, immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, blessing God. And that's one of the, the beautiful things that happens with prophecy is because it's connected with being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, being blessed by his presence. We break out in praise, blessing God and for who he is and for the, the, the wonder of his glorious presence, his loving presence, his presence that's bring joy and peace and, and excitement to our lives. So the first thing he did was bless God and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see this over and over and prophesied, saying. And just to let you know, this prophesying uh, happens with Mary, Elizabeth. You could even say John because he leaps in his mother's womb when Jesus walks in the, ro the room and they start speaking spirit anointed talk. It's like John was not able to speak he wasn't born yet but he's almost he, he leapt in his mother's womb filled with joy zechariah prophesied simeon after the birth of jesus prophesies and of the prophetesses mentioned but back to zechariah immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he spoke blessing god and his father zechariah was filled with the holy spirit and prophesied saying Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. See, it's blessing God. For he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now there's two things there. Blessed be the Lord. He's excited just about the presence of God, giving him the ability to speak and speak supernaturally because he couldn't speak a word before. And then when he uses that word for that is underlined, that, that's purpose. Uh, part of the reasons he's blessing the Lord is in terms of blessing uh, God, praising him, and giving him thanks are all related. And the reason, one of the reasons he blesses God is because he has fulfilled his promise. He's visiting them. He's going to redeem his people. He's going to raise up a horn of salvation, means uh, a, a king, someone powerful. And then he says, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. And as he prophesies, he starts reciting the story of the prophets and the story of the Bible. In other words, the biblical history. 
that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And they had been in fear and their enemies had been successfully giving them a horrible time. But now they're breaking forth in praise and prophecy and thanksgiving because God is answering all of their prayers miraculously. And then he speaks directly to this child who is only eight days old. And he says, and you child will be called the prophet of the most high. And notice this is future tense. So this is predicting what will happen with this baby boy. You will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. And, and the basic message of John the Baptist was we repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the forgiveness of sins. And that is exactly the same uh, message that Jesus took like a baton as a runner. And Jesus also preached that we should repent for the forgiveness of sins because the kingdom of God is at hand. So this child, he says, you will be called a prophet. You will go before the Lord to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the way of peace is through Jesus. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, in other words, that's the forgiveness of sins, that where Jesus, if faith through him, his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness, so it's just as if I had never sinned. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the peace. My prayer for you is as we approach Christmas, you'll have a time to sing Silent Night. Maybe you'll be able to watch our, our broadcast church service and you'll experience the peace of God that passes all understanding that comes through Jesus and his advent is coming on earth. Because when we put our faith in him, we are justified. It's just as if we'd never sinned, at least in the eyes of God. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith. We can come to God all the time now into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So I wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you peace in your hearts. I wish you to celebrate the awe of the glory of God and all the supernatural reality that came through the birth of Christ and comes to us now as his gift. And as I say Merry Christmas, I leave you with this reading from Luke chapter 2. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So Merry Christmas. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.